Hi, I'm Dr. Van der Vakorska, and this is Inequality Bites. There's poetry redefined, fathers from the left behind, novels of a different kind, need to make a state of mind. Look how master minds are getting sent down to mind. Take a look at our strengths all combined. This is Inequality Bites, the podcast where we discuss how we can make society more equal so that everyone can flourish. In this series, we'll speak not only to experts on a range of different inequalities, but vitally also to those at the sharp end of inequality. Inequality Bites is created by the Equality Trust, the charity working to improve quality of life in the UK by reducing social and economic inequality, because more equal societies are better for us all. In today's episode, we're delighted to be talking to Menaka Shanmugananta from Toronto, Canada. Menaka is a public health professional who holds a master's in public health from the University of Toronto. She spent the earlier stages of her career supporting health research projects in both government and academic institutions. She's passionate about using evidence, policy and advocacy to address the social, political and economic determinants of health and well-being. Menaka is a daughter of Tamil immigrants from Sri Lanka and grew up in Toronto, Ontario. She currently resides in Paris with her partner. Menaka approaches debates on public and mental health with a unique perspective, using both lived experience and research analysis. So hello, and welcome to Inequality Bites, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Wanda. That was a great um, introduction. I'm delighted and honoured to be here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. The honour and pleasure is all ours, I can assure you. <laughs> so sort of going back to your roots, could you share with our listeners a little bit about your background and how and where you grew up? Mm -hmm, of course. So as you mentioned, I grew up in Toronto, Canada, um, in sort of a suburban part of the city. Um, and that's where I spent most of my life, my education and career. This year, I moved to Paris because my, my boyfriend, he's German and he got a job here. And I thought, you know, why not? I didn't realize there would be a pandemic, but <laughs> it's been an interesting ride so far. From a professional perspective, I am yeah, I have a background in public health. I've spent a lot of time on a, a variety of different projects with different content areas, but I think professionally speaking, I'm most interested in acting on the social, economic, and political determinants of health, which you described, because I believe that these are sort of the largest determinants of population health outcomes and well-being. Yeah, so that's a little bit about my background. Well, I think if I had to choose a city to be locked down in, in a pandemic, it probably would be Paris. So I, th I think you did quite well there. Um, yeah. <laughs> when did you first notice that inequality existed? Yeah, that's a great question. And I had to think about that because it was probably like a series of events that sort of like accumulation of that. But I think I, th I like to think of like this quote that there's a comedian in the US, his name is Hari Kondabolu. And he in an interview talked about how he was like sheltered in diversity growing up in like Queens, New York. And I feel like that really mirrored my own experience growing up in Toronto, like in the particular area I grew up in, I feel like I didn't even realize that for instance, racial inequality maybe was a thing because my upbringing was so diverse. And it was only kind of when I went to this like high school that was like a more affluent area that like I kind of realized like, oh, like, wow, there are differences in class, there are differences in race. Like it was really, uh, I think, a huge change in my life when I started to sort of see these things and sort of changes and sort of the ways that economics and society are like, are structured. And I think that that's kind of when I, I started to notice that like in, in high school, I noticed that like people that I went to school with dressed differently, they spoke differently than the people that I grew up with. And it was just like a completely different, it was kind of like a, a culture shock almost. <laughs> so I think, yeah, I feel like that that's kind of like an accurate uh, description of like kind of when there was like a pivotal shift, I guess. And so, you know, having noticed all of that inequality, having been brought up in diversity, I find that absolutely fascinating because I grew up in the north of England in a very white place where, you know, I was probably one of the only handful of, of non-white people around in the 1970s. So I find this idea of being sheltered by diversity absolutely amazing and, and you know, I'm <laughs> rather wistful. But yeah. when did you start to connect inequality with the issue of mental health? I think like... In general, I, I've been always interested in creating a more equitable and like care centered world that's more socially just and mental health has always felt a part of that. I think a lot of the discourse in the Western world, because like mental health, there's a lot of 
focus in industrialized worlds on mental health and that has brought like a little bit more awareness but i i feel like this awareness has been um very much like an individualized biomedical focus and i don't think there's enough uh focus on like the upstream forces that kind of impact mental health um and so that kind of is why i became more kind of interested in that and as somebody for instance i i experience like mental health issues myself and i have a lot of friends that do someone who's like who can kind of see the things in people and my peers lives and my in my own life that are impacting my mental health it became sort of frustrating not seeing that like there isn't enough conversation even within public health spaces around the sort of economic and social determinants of health and so i think yeah it came from a a lens of trying to move away from this like individual focus and behaviors which is obviously important but that looking at like what influences individual behavior and why are people um getting sick and what can we do besides just offering them more therapy like what is something that what's a way that we can like upstream solve this issue um which i guess like um it's a very common lens in like sort of population public health discourse and such i i think you're right it is in that area but i think really still we're stuck in that sort of effort of of sending people to therapies or cbt or talking therapies and as you said very much making this about the individual and their past and their parents and their family without actually looking at the environment in which they have grown up i've always found that absolutely you know phenomenally strange that, that yeah. you know we we've continued with the freudian and the jungian and all of these schools of <laughs> of psychotherapy and psychoanalysis and and nobody sort of said well well actually that person grew up in that environment so do you think that might have a bit to do with it so i really welcome this focus on on more of the environmental aspect of that and i think organizations here in the uk are are beginning to look at that But we heard in the series um from Professor Richard Wilkinson about how high levels of economic inequality are fueling a mental health epidemic. Would you say that your work supports that and you know particularly in the context of of the pandemic at the moment? Mhm, yeah, it's a great question. Richard Wilkinson and Kate Kate Pickett's research and and work led me to the Equality Trust because I love I love 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 their their work and the book that um the inner level that i read and they did like a talk in in canada which is how i found out about them and yeah so i i think like their work has really also been pivotal pivotal sorry in in sort of like validating some like you know lived experiences that a lot of us face but i think like as you said during covid i think i cannot you can really see that economic inequality fueled by our current economic structures create sort of individualistic cultures that i think invoke harm on our psyches in general and i think that this manifests in a lot of ways and like richard and kate i guess have spoke to this in the past and they've done research on this but i think people in the lowest socioeconomic groups and like racialized individuals and people who exist on the margins in general often have worse mental health than those in the middle groups um and i think they you know there's a social gradient when when it comes to mental health problems and they become more common the further down the ladder that you are and i think these are due to a variety of factors including poor labor conditions job security less autonomy at work financial insecurity perceived standing in society social ex- exclusion and these can be compounded by other factors because they can coexist with things like racial inequality for instance in canada racialized people experience poverty in disproportionate numbers compared to like white groups and i think that these sort of barriers and issues have just been exacerbated by covid-19 and you see that like people's mental health outcomes are getting worse across the board but i think that these marginalized groups are experiencing the worst effects of it <laughs> unfortunately yep and i think similar research shows shows those results here in the uk as well and and i think one of the factors as well is is the lack of black or asian practitioners as well so it's very difficult if you are going into therapy for example to find a black therapist or an asian therapist right is that the situation in canada yeah yeah it's the exact same situation yeah there's like a lot specifically i think like black and indigenous um health health practitioners are like there's a dearth of that in Canada and i think that there's a lot of institutional barriers and a lot of different reasons as to why that's not the case and it contributes to like the effect the actual health effects that we see the kind of health inequalities that we see across the country 
So can you tell us a little bit about your work? I've been like in the working world for most of my adult life, just because I've been working so many jobs since I started university. But since I think like graduating from university, I've, I've been like fortunate to work in a lot of different areas, particularly in academic and university or sorry, academic and like government settings. So most recently I was working with the city of Toronto, so the municipal government on in the healthy public policy team. And we worked on a bunch of different projects related to climate change and extreme heat, implementing a health and all policy approach. In the past, I've also worked on projects related to youth health and youth mental youth mental health. And yeah, like I, I think I've I'm very much somebody who's like is interested in a lot of different areas just because I see the importance of all those different areas. And I I always operate, I think, from a lens of like social, economic and political sort of equality. And I think that that's kind of infused in the work that I do. And that's probably the common trend. But yeah, that's like a, a description, I guess, of my work that I've been doing so far. I have to say that's music to my ears because, you know, one of the things we really struggle to do in some ways, or at least before COVID, was was to get people to think in that linked up way that inequality affects mental health and it affects violent crime and it affects poverty and all of these things. And I think, you know, unfortunately, the pandemic has um, made that a reality for a lot of people and it's getting far more profile now, but it's it's about not looking at things in silos really, isn't it? Which I think is, is one of the public policy failures in a sense. So loneliness and isolation are now commonplace in the lives of, of many of us, but particularly with young people. Why, why is this particularly so prominent among our young people? So I think that that young people are responding correctly to like very real forces in our lives, as with like most ailments that manifest in in our individual bodies. I think loneliness is like a failure of our environments and the powers who have created or, or neglected them. And, you know, I think whether it's if we look at urbanization and how cities are built with more than like half of the world's population now living in urban areas and virtually all countries of the world are increasingly be, increasingly becoming urbanized. Um, whether we look at that and how like the infrastructure around cities, or if we look at like economic forces such as austerity, um, increased neoliberalism since the 1970s in countries such as the UK, the US and Canada. I think that those economic forces increase this like culture of efficiency and self-interest and performance at the expense of social ties in our communities. And I think that that enhances loneliness and feelings of of, um, distrust. And I I really do think that that is a huge reason why a lot of young people are feeling socially isolated and lonely. And I, I think that reflects the changes in society, especially since the 80s. I mean, I, you know, I grew up in the 80s and I can honestly say there's a lot less collective action, a lot less community, a lot less, you know, you don't know your neighbours or, but I mean, what we've seen over the pandemic as well is that people have started to come together in certain ways and have felt that need for some sort of connection. So, you know, there's, there's, that's happening, but it's clearly not enough. And it's, it's obviously not, you know, bringing our young people out of this sort of pit of, of despair in a sense. And do you think that this is linked to the increased consumerism that we've seen over those years as well? I think in general, uh, societies with higher levels of income inequality are linked to higher prevalence of mental illness and poor mental health, including chronic stress, anxiety and depression and bipolar disorder and addiction, which, you know, the inner level shows really well. And this affects everyone in these societies with the worst impacts being experienced by those on the margins. And with regards to consumerism, I think that you know, income inequality exacerbates social status divisions with people being more like aware of their and others position on the social ladder. So I think people tend to pay more attention to markers of social success in societies that are more unequal, which prompts status competition and anxiety where people are concerned about their social position and where they sort of rank in that situation. And similarly, I feel like these status differentials like reinforce social norms around consumption and they discourage sort of values of like communality. And I think having sort of communality and trust is, is really pivotal to be able to feel 
connected. And I do think that that is somehow related to the individualism is also related to the, you know, the, the consumption patterns. And, you know, in my, in my own experience, so Canada is not, I think, as if you look at the Gini coefficients, Canada isn't as unequal in terms of the Gini coefficient compared to the US and the UK, but I I could still feel that all those things growing up in what is now the economic capital of Canada and going to some of like the more prestigious schools in Canada. Canada doesn't have the same sort of disparities in terms of like prestigious universities with the UK and like how the US has Ivy League schools and stuff because the majority of our universities are publicly funded, but you still see those behaviors, you know, among in, in universities and in kind of high stress, you know, settings. And I think that it's really hard not to internalize those those sort of hierarchies and those patterns and that sense of sense of competition. And I think that also reflects what society sees as success. You know, we are constantly told that success is owning your own house or, you know, an ever bigger car or several holidays a year or, you know, going to the best schools and that sort of thing. And and we are very much measured by those by those um, issues. So, I, you know, this is this is not surprising in the system that we live in, is it? But one of the areas that you're interested in is neoliberal perfectionism. Could you tell us a bit about that concept and why is it relevant in today's society? Neoliberal perfectionism is a term that I saw that was coined in a Jacobin article by Megan Day. So she she references a study by Thomas Kieran and Andrew P. Hill, who are researchers based in the UK. And the studies looked at perfectionism as a cultural phenomenon through conducting a meta-analysis of birth cohort differences from 1989 to 2016 in order to examine whether levels of perfectionism have increased over the past three decades in American, Canadian, and and British university institutions, so among um, university students. What I think so, was so fascinating, there's a few things about the study, but one is that they looked at different dimensions of perfectionism. So one, they define something called self-oriented perfectionism. So it's defined as when it's directed towards the self, individuals attach irrational importance to being perfect, hold unrealistic expectations of themselves, and are punitive in their self-evaluation. And that's kind of our most, I think, common perception and idea of what perfectionism is. And then the second definition of perfectionism that they use is socially prescribed perfectionism. And that's when when the perfectionism is basically perceived from others. So when it's perceived to come from others, individuals believe their social context is excessively demanding, that others judge them harshly, and they must display perfection to secure approval. That's what, what the definition is quoted. And other-oriented perfectionism, which is when perfectionistic expectations are directed towards others, individuals impose unrealistic standards on those around them and evaluate others critically. And they found, which I I thought was really interesting because I had never heard kind of the socially prescribed perfectionism and other oriented perfectionism before, but the study found that all dimensions increased over the past 27 years. So I guess in other words, uh, recent generations of young people perceive that others are more demanding of them, are more demanding of others and are just more demanding of themselves. And the link to neoliberalism is that Um, that the authors postulate that these changes are due in part to the emergence of neoliberalism and competitive individualism. And they also attribute it to the use of the philosophy of meritocracy and um, increasingly anxious and controlling parental practices. So I thought that this study was really interesting because perfectionism is is like kind of in the psychological sense is kind of associated with other psychological disorders or other kind of mon- mental health vulnerabilities. So perfectionism is defined as, as ha- like being a core vulnerability to a variety of other disorders, symptoms and syndromes, such as anxiety disorders, depression and suicidal thoughts. So I think that this is, you know, really interesting to look at how a cultural shift um, in, in sort of values um, due to like economic changes re- has resulted sort of in these individual changes and in how we relate to one another and how we behave with one another. And I feel like it felt really relevant because it was stuff that I saw in my own experience, you know, as a student. And I think that 
obviously this is a very like small like like the cohort are like university students so it's not necessarily applicable to the entire population but I think it's still like remarkable to sort of like extrapolate that something like perfectionism has like economic and political origins which is something that I think needs requires more attention. I think that's absolutely fascinating because I think all of us can think about people we know or instances we've been in where we've held ourselves to those standards to you know absolutely punishing standards that we could probably never ever um, never ever meet whether it's about body image whether it's about our jobs or our status or our academic status or achievement so I, I think that's absolutely universally relevant and it's really fascinating to to hear that framework um, into which we we can put this and it's it's really interesting because obviously it's been absolutely fueled by social media which allows us to critique each other um, in so many ways without having any repercussions or accountability um, so it removes us that that way from from what we're actually saying or who we're actually judging um, so it must have absolutely fueled that type of behavior for sure social media has is un, like unquestionably had an impact on on sort of perfectionism and the way that this has like increased over time and i think what's what's really terrifying in a sense um as a mother as well is, is seeing the effect and the impact on our children from an ever earlier age it's not just the i must have the right trainers it's you know it's oh what am i doing on tiktok or what are my friends doing on you know whatsapp or whatever and it, it is actually infiltrating our kids lives at an ever earlier age so that's it's really something that we have to be very very considerate about yeah that's why i thought that was interesting that it was another that that was one of the reasons was like increased controlling behavior among parents i think that that was really interesting as a reason that they kind of attributed to the rise um, of this sort of behavior yeah, and I, and I think we know from the um, books about how the middle classes are hoarding opportunities and for their children so that they're ensuring that they're not missing out on anything. And almost, you know, a lot of children don't have that opportunity to fail or to just be bored because, you know, they're constantly hurried from one class to another and constantly made to feel, you know, they have to be good at so many different things. So yeah. it's, it's really having a, a detrimental effect on our, on our children. Thanks for listening to Inequality Bites. If you're enjoying today's podcast, would you consider donating the cost of a cup of coffee or lunch to the Equality Trust? This will help us to support young people to speak truth to power, to campaign on key issues like fair and equal pay, and to produce more online content like this podcast to raise awareness of the damage that inequality causes and how we can reduce this, because inequality is not inevitable. We understand that not everyone can donate, so if you can't, then please visit our website to sign up to our mailing list, take action on our latest campaigns, and follow us on social media. Thanks for listening, and enjoy the rest of the podcast. On Inequality Bites, we like to discuss the vital problems, but also the solutions. So Maynaka, what do you think needs to be done to combat loneliness and isolation among young people? I think that the solution needs to be multi-pronged, um, you know. So at one level, our societal values need to shift. So we sort of need to reject this sort of individualism that that is pervasive in our cultures and reintroduce like collective values back into our society. And this requires a shift from, you know, addressing individuals psychological states to more of a focus on the social on social justice and broader economic and social conditions. I think it also involves action on the material conditions, on policies, on politics. So the radical reallocation of economic resources, more inclusion of young people in political processes, um, particularly at the local level. Um, adopting a mental health and all policies approach, um, which promotes action in non-health policy arenas, including like, for instance, employment and welfare. It involves like, as I was discussing earlier about the built environment, so it involves investments at, in the built environment. So designing friendlier landscapes to foster pro-social behavior, public communal spaces, like community gardens, parks, libraries sidewalks, more affordable housing. It involves solutions in sort of like all of these, all of these areas, I think.
as always, when we're talking about inequality, this, the solutions have to be all encompassing, don't they? As someone who's passionate about addressing population mental health, what do you think the sector could do better? I think, especially speaking from a Canadian lens, and I know this is probably for sure applicable in the US and the UK, there needs to be more like cost appropriate care. So in Canada, the only way that you're able to access publicly funded care is through a medical doctor. And I think that there needs to be better ways of accessing therapists, of accessing all types of mental health professionals that are affordable, because right now it's only through your employment contracts that you're able to access those extended health care benefits. And those are quite limited in and of itself. Um, and, you know, even an, an, in another, you know, outside the mental health sector, I think that there needs to be ways of supporting mental health in community settings, like, you know, outside traditional institutional settings that are often, you know, described as being tainted with like racism and classism for a lot of folks and building capacity for communities to become trained as their own healers. In Toronto, we have this like model, which is like the community healers uh, involves community. It's a community healing project. And I think that that sort of adopts that approach of like training people in the community to become like advocates and healers and um, support for people in, the, in their own surroundings, which I think is really cool. Broader than that, I think mental health literacy is important, you know, um, particularly for those on the margins. There really isn't an understanding of what mental health is. It's not just people who have a mental health disorder or illness who need to understand what, how to, you know, support positive mental health. So I think that is something that schools, the government, all sectors could could get involved in. And, you know, in some health inequalities re research, it's argued that an exclusive focus on health may over medicalize the issue. So sometimes there should also, I think there should be a focus on the awareness of larger structures and forces that contribute to health inequalities that impact our mental health. And so it's a lot of things I listed, but I feel like that that's kind of like where I would direct my focus. And I think as ever and as ever more people are beginning to realise that it's all about tackling those structural inequalities in order to get any real change. And I think what you're saying there as well is that, you know, we, we must stop working from a deficit model. So how can we ensure that young people have a voice and we can unlock their agency to define the policy and services that they use when it comes to mental health? I think first there needs to sort of be... At the, at the very least, like less of this like tokenized engagement, I think people, which I do see a lot of organizations doing and a lot of uh, people who do meaningful engagement with youth really well. But I think in general, trying to offer more meaningful ways to engage youth, um, you know, mentoring them, training them, equipping them with the tools, also just leveraging their strengths and giving them the opportunities to contribute is really useful. Like young Canadians, for instance, are the most educated, connected and diverse generation. And I think they have a lot of really interesting and smart and cool things to say. And I think just sort of giving, leveraging those strengths is a really great way of kind of giving them that opportunity and, and making them feel like their voices matter. I think we live in a very ageist culture. And I think we don't very really value the expertise of younger people. We think that they're too idealistic, that they don't um, really know the real world. So I think like understanding and working from a place of empowerment that they have something to offer um, just as much as like anyone else, I think is a, a good place to start from the political level, because I always um, go towards that voting for government parties that increase budgets for youth serving organizations and youth workers that do that work of empowering youth is important and, you know, creating infrastructure that youth rely upon supporting a youth responsive ecosystem automatically supports an ecosystem that I think is good for everybody. So I think that that's something that I think needs to be done at the political level. Wow, that's been a really stimulating discussion. And I've certainly learned a lot from that. So at this point in the podcast, we like to ask our guests for one thing listeners can do today one thing they can do this week, and one thing they can do this year to have an impact on inequality. So what would be your suggestions? One thing that people can do today is to buy from local organizations and companies that pay their employees fair wages and that have ethical labor practices. So for instance, supporting independent bookstores instead of buying things on Amazon, 
I think that that's something that, you know, everyone can do if they're able to, of course. This week, I think if you haven't already done so, talking to a friend or family member about the impacts of inequality and why it's important. Inequality impacts the majority of people on this earth. So there's always a way of connecting it to their everyday lives and their story and getting people invested in that and in this issue. This year, I think because tackling inequality will necessitate bold cross-sectoral policy action on wider social and economic policies, for example, relating to uh, social protection, the redistribution of wages, fair employment practices, and you know, housing policy, supporting political candidates that advance areas or advance these areas is important. So outside of electoral politics, though, um, I think supporting radical media and research helping to amplify and support organizations like the Equality Trust, um, supporting grassroots or community organizing in your area. And if that doesn't exist, like helping to build that, you know, for you and your community. So I think that's kind of the long-term goal. <laughs> well, there's some great recommendations there. And obviously I would say if you're coming to this podcast new, then please do check out the episodes that have gone before for a really good grounding on um, the ins and outs of inequality. But also check out the Equality Trust website, follow us on Twitter or other forms of social media and have those conversations. It's really important to be talking to people about how inequality affects us all. Because remember, inequality isn't inevitable. It's a policy choice. So Maynaka, thanks very much for joining us. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Thanks so much for having me. This was an absolute pleasure. Thank you for listening to Inequality Bites, the podcast exploring not just the damage that inequality is causing, but also the solutions, so that we can create a more equal society that's better for everyone. In our next episode, we'll be speaking to Mai Gabriel, the founder of Bits OK, a charity for 15 to 25 year olds experiencing moderate to severe mental health issues. Mai will be speaking about her experiences of being hospitalised with severe depression as a teenager and how intersecting inequalities have impacted on her mental health. One of the biggest things that people can do when talking to others about their mental health is just listen. Often when someone tries to talk about their own mental health, people rush to try and come up with like solutions or cures for their kind of illness or problem, which is so unhelpful. So and most of the time people who are offering the advice aren't professionals and they don't have the same experience. So sometimes kind of often what I say to people is it's okay to just listen and say that's rubbish and I'm sorry and I'm here for you. Let us know what you thought on Twitter. Subscribe, like and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Acast or whatever platform you're listening on and tell your friends. See you next time for Inequality Bites.